Okay, again this evening I'm going to uh, give a talk on a subject which was a request by uh, somebody a couple of weeks ago. They asked me to talk about self-discipline. So, if you are not a disciplined person, then listen to this. <laughs> it's a strange subject to talk about self-discipline when an essential part of the Buddha's teachings is his no self. So I can truly say I have no self-discipline. <laughs> but really what I mean is that you discipline the non-self. So what you're, what you're doing, you're disciplining the mind. So we're talking about mind discipline now. And of course it's a very important part of each one of our lives. And sometimes we know what we should be doing, we just can't do it. We want to find out how we can do it, how we could put our ideals of our life into practice so we're not just talking about it, we're actually doing it. Recently when I was in Singapore, I went to a, a fundraising walk. It was only a small walk we were doing, about five or six kilometers to raise funds for a temple. And the, uh, the walk, the event, it was opened by one of the politicians. And I asked that politician, are you going on the walk? He said, no. And I said, oh, you're one of those people who talk the walk. <laughs> you're not walking the talk. <laughs> it was true. He laughed. But <laughs> so actually, why is it that sometimes that we can't sort of walk the talk, we only talk the walk? And it's just because that we need to find these strategies for sort of disciplining the mind. And it might seem strange to you that uh, it was strange actually to the ABC who came to do that documentary for George Negus's program a couple of weeks ago that when they came to visit our monastery down at Serpentine that there was discipline there but it was a discipline which was very different than you see say in an army. That it wasn't tight or heavy or tense but there was a sense of a natural discipline happening. And this is an important part of what we mean by self-discipline. We're not really talking about sort of like army, sort of rules. Because if that discipline is running in that direction, it's running through fear, through you know, wanting to evade punishment. And it always needs to inf be enforced with things like punishment, or with cajoling, or with hard speech. I think many of you have stayed at my monastery Many of you have known me for many years. And I don't know if you've known me ever shouting at anybody, even though sometimes you deserve to be <laughs> shouted at. <laughs> but you realize that's not the way to actually to make things work, either to get the best out of another person or to get the best out of oneself. And so when we're talking about self-discipline or disciplining one's mind, it's the same as disciplining other people. There is many ways of doing it and the obvious way of like through threats and fears and punishments if I don't get up this morning I'm not going to have any breakfast you, you do that, you don't get up in time in the morning you think oh well there's extenuating circumstances I will have my breakfast anyway too often you can't do that to yourself so there has to be other ways of actually getting what we call self-discipline and what we actually do is like through encouragement rather than through punishment. The two different ways. It's interesting in a talk I gave at Armadale last Tuesday, someone was complaining about all this present moment awareness business. They were saying that isn't it important to actually to learn from your mistakes of the past? And actually many people think that way. You should learn from the mistakes you've made in the past. But I made the comment that no. You should learn from the successes you make in the past, not learn from the mistakes. <laughs> now there's a very profound difference there. Why is it that when we look at, say, the past, we always think we should learn from our mistakes? All we're doing there is looking at the negative and wanting to punish ourselves, or try harder next time, don't do that again, silly me. But actually we can do the other way, which is it's learning from our successes in life. Isn't it strange that very few people say that? You learn from your mistakes. You don't learn from your mistakes. You learn from the successes. Because I recall just being a 
school teacher and learned about the two types of teaching, the positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement. This was basic educational psychology over 30 years old, but still hasn't really been implemented in schools. It is in a little way, but not as much as it could be. Positive reinforcement in education was when anybody did something right, you praised them, you encouraged them, you said that, you know, what you've done is a marvellous thing, you gave them a prize, a hug, a smile, whatever. You gave encouragement for when they did the thing right. And you ignored completely, you didn't pay any attention at all to when they made a mistake. We usually are accustomed to negative reinforcement, which when somebody makes a mistake, we tell them off, we punish them, we tell them to do it again, stand in the corner, write hundred lines, or whatever else it is, we tell people off. We expect people to learn from their mistakes. But what happens? We lose our self-esteem, we get discouraged. Usually the only thing we ever learn is how not to get caught next time. That's all we learn from, <laughs> from punishments, from negativity. So actually it's a different way of looking at it. Instead of learning from our mistakes and actually uh, remembering all the rotten things which happened to us, all the mistakes we did, all the terrible things, maybe I'll do it better next time. How about the opposite, learning from our successes? What went right? When happiness came? When we succeeded? Why? 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 And isn't it strange that our society is always focusing on our mistakes, not focusing on what's positive? Why don't we learn from our successes? Psychology has shown it's far more effective. So, when we're disciplining ourselves, what do we mean by disciplining ourselves? Trying to make us better people. Instead of focusing too much on mistakes which makes you negative, which uh, sucks away your positive energy, which makes you depressed, frustrated, I can't do anything, this is really hopeless. How about focusing on your successes. That's how we discipline ourselves. So when you do get up in the morning, give yourself an extra piece of breakfast, whatever else you eat for breakfast, an extra bowl of muesli, an extra tub of yogurt, or whatever else you eat. But instead of actually punishing yourself when you do things wrong. Because in that encouragement, you can see what's happening. You're giving yourself pleasure, you're giving yourself a support, you're applauding yourself. And by that applauding yourself, you're encouraging yourself to do better next time. To do even more better next time so you can get your reward again. You might get fat by that method, but you'll certainly be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but what we really mean is that this is actually how you encourage yourself to be good. Now, can you see that that's the way people make mistakes? They try and discipline themselves by punishing themselves. You know, if it's trying to give up smoking, if I don't make it, then you feel so, so depressed. How many people have you strive to achieve something, to do something, to better yourself, and after you failed, you sort of punish yourself, you feel depressed, you give up all of your hope, and it makes it harder even next time. It makes it harder to do anything. That's why the first thing about self-discipline, discipline the mind, is with encouragement. So, for a lot of times it's very hard being an abbot of a monastery with so many monks. Because when they do things wrong, I have to turn a blind eye, not to see it. Just like I remember one of those, mo these are the old people, one of those old movies I used to see, Hogan's Heroes. One of my heroes was Schultz. They say, I see nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> and that's sometimes what I feel like as an abbot. I see nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> But, except when you see somebody do something good, then you encourage them, you praise them. And that way you get greater success. You are disciplining somebody. You're moving them into a way they want to be. Because all of discipline, all of your movements of body, speech and mind, why you do things, is always the positive way, the one which really works, is always the greater happiness. Someone once asked me what the meaning of life is. And again, it is the, the movement towards happiness. That's why we do things. And so we can harness that. We can harness that and make whatever we want to succeed in life, make that happy. Give some sort of reward. If there's not an uh, inherent reward in succeeding, 
give that reward to yourself, but put aside all that negativity and the punishment. Otherwise, people are get in discipline because they think, why bother? Why should I do this? Life is just so hard, so negative. When you get into that hardness and that negativity, as I've pointed out before, that sucks up your energy to do things, to strive, to actually achieve anything in life. Negativity sucks away energy. But the positivity, the joy, the happiness, the encouragement, the applause, that raises your energy level. Any sports person knows that through the encouragement of you know, people cheering you on at the sides, that gives you greater energy. But if somebody comes around and says, you stupid this, you stupid that, you're giving a terrible talk, you're a terrible soccer game, whatever it is, then you have no energy left. Because it's that happiness, encouragement, increases that energy, the energy to do. Which is why that, that great teaching of discipline, which was from the Chinese art of war, remember this because I teach this very often in meditation retreats, is where the emperor had one general who always had perfect discipline in the army, they asked him what was his secret, he said, Cause I only tell my troops to do what they want to do. Imagine a general in an army telling the soldiers, I need to do what you want to do. The emperor said, they just l sleep in all day, they never go to battle, they never train, they just take it easy. What do you mean you only tell them what you want to do? And of course, the secret there was a motivation to teaching them to want to get up early in the morning, to want to train, even teaching them through patriotism or whatever to want to go and fight. To that motivation, he had perfect discipline in the army. They couldn't wait to get up in the morning. They couldn't wait to go and... Uh, uh, train, they couldn't wait to fight. Now this is actually how you create that discipline in yourself. Whatever it is you want to achieve in life, do you really want to do that? Are you encouraged to do that? Are you encouraged for the reward? You see the reward, you see the benefit in that. You really want to do it. Then discipline becomes easy. It becomes natural. And also because of the sheer happiness you have the energy to do it. Imagine living in a monastery, having to get up at four o'clock in the morning in the cold winter months when there's not a heater in your hut. Actually, it's soft in our monastery. In Thai, we used to get up at three o'clock in the morning. How can you do that? I used to think, well, if I don't get up, well, I said, I've got to get up sometime anyway. Might as well get it over and done with. <laughs> <laughs> and so you got into the habit of making a fun out of getting up in the morning. I used to jump out of bed and used to sing, zippity doo da, another lovely day, way. <laughs> you see, you're laughing. I was laughing. It was a stupid thing to do, but it made me sort of happy. You've got to get up in the morning. You might as well make it happy. Imagine the other thing, the other way of getting up, just you to peel off the blankets one by one. <laughs> now what sort of way <laughs> is that to get up in the morning? Because the, the blankets, they peel back again, right over you after a couple of minutes. You know, five more minutes, ten more minutes, and then it's of an hour or two hours gone by. So you've got to get up anyway, so make fun of it. Enjoy it. And then you want to get up in the morning. You want to do things. So again, it's that motivating yourself. It's the first, most important part of that discipline. You really, really want to. And you've got that positive mind state. And you reward yourself. You get up in the morning. This, whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, you make it meaningful. When it's meaningful, so the discipline comes again quite naturally. You see the purpose in this. And you want to do it. And there's joy in doing it. You're not wanting to do it out of fear and fear of punishment. That's the negative, the negative reinforcement, the negative way of teaching, which does not work. So give yourself rewards. You feel good about it. And then actually you find just actually how you can actually work with this. I was just saying a little bit about meditation retreats. Many of you have been on the retreats with me, and you may know something about retreats, something we call Nobel Silence. You know what noble silence means? 
in my retreats there are no bells we don't ring a bell in the morning to get people up we don't ring a bell for lunch we don't ring a bell for this meditation or that meditation I've been on retreats like that which have got external discipline 4 o'clock in the morning everybody must get up and you're looking around to see who's missing and 10 o'clock lights out and everybody immediately goes back and you can see that people are just so tense they're just so afraid of you know being late and sometimes people have you know these nightmares of being late and being the last one there that's that running out of fear that's just the external discipline and I've tried that when I first was a monk and first started you know, teaching retreats you were just following what other people did and you find that people weren't getting into decent meditation, they were getting tight and tense and that's the last thing they wanted on a meditation retreat, that's what they were doing for the rest of their life, at work and at home and I was doing the same thing, so I started stopping this, I started stopping the bells, having no bell silence and soon I got the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> everyone was getting much more peaceful than they'd ever got in other retreats and it was amazing when you didn't force people to meditate at a certain time when the discipline was not enforced by me you found people when you, I used to get into that hall quarter past four in the morning there'd be people already sitting there they got up way before me you go to bed about or leave the hall about 10 o'clock, 10.30 there would still be people meditating in there what was going on? Why was I getting more out of my students when there was no bells? Simply because people wanted to meditate. When it got to late at night, they weren't afraid. Oh, I better go to sleep now, otherwise I won't be able to get up when the bell rings in the morning. They weren't afraid anymore. And a natural discipline started to occur. It was a discipline of happiness. They meditated because they wanted to meditate. There's a great way of meditating. People were sitting there and usually, you know, these retreats when you have a bell after 50 minutes or one hour you've got to go and do something else. They're meditating for two hours and three hours at a time. Even more than that. They were beating their records, not because they were trying to, because they kept wanting to meditate. And that showed me meditation is just one example of what discipline really is. And there, I was like that Chinese general. I had got so much discipline from the people on my retreats. Why? Because I only told them what they wanted to do. I was encouraging them. Compassion, wisdom, mindfulness, all coming together in this beautiful way out how to get the best out of those meditators. And again, I don't just talk the walk, I walk that talk. That's how I do it with myself. Whenever I meditate, I don't set a time. You're going to have to meditate for such a long time, except here on a Friday evening, because I know that if I go too long, I get into trouble. <laughs> but usually at my, med my monastery, you just go and sit down and see how long it takes. You keep on meditating when you want to. And that's like being a monk. Why are you a monk? Because I like being a monk. Sometimes people think, oh, it's so hard being a monk. Oh, you can't eat what you want to eat. You can't watch the TV, you can't watch the movies, there's no sex, there's no sport. Don't you miss something? I do miss something, I must admit. I miss all that suffering. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this is an old Zen story about this person who came to see this monk. And as soon as he saw this monk, and this monk had been a monk for so many years, and he bowed to him out of great respect. Oh, I respect you so much. You're a monk who keeps all these rules and it must be so hard in your monastery. And the monk says, is that why you're bowing to me? Because it's so difficult? Yeah, I bow to anyone who does something so hard. So the monk got down and bowed to the man. He said, it's much harder being a lay person than being a monk. You've got to get up early in the morning. You've got trouble with your wife. You've got trouble with your kids. You've got many more headaches than I've got. Therefore, it must be much harder if I'm going to bow to you. <laughs> Because, sure, this, on the external, look at the discipline of a monk. And many of you know our monastery, you've lived there, you've actually watched us for many years, that we keep all those rules. 
we're very, some people think we're very strict. But does it look like a strict monk? Because I always had the idea that someone who was strict was someone who never smiles like a Puritan. You know, who was just really tough and just dour and grim and would never have a laugh. We are strict with our every rules, but in a very light way. And that you show you can keep your rules much better when you have happiness than when you're trying out of negativity. The discipline is coming from within rather than from without. The discipline is coming with meaning. So you just want to keep those rules. You just want to, to live simply. You just want to be peaceful. You just want to be silent. And then the discipline comes naturally. It's very, sometimes, you wonder just how a person can keep their mind still when they're meditating. I'm using meditation as my example about discipline because that's something we all do here. How do you keep your mind still? And sometimes I've given the example recently in my monastery, it's like holding a cup still. You can try and hold this cup as still as you can. You can discipline your arm and your reflexes and you hold this cup as still as you possibly can. But every time I try this, my cup always vibrates. It always wobbles slightly. Because I cannot keep it absolutely still even though I try. You know how I figured out how to keep the cup still? <laughs> That's why you put it down. <laughs> and now it's still. <laughs> And that's actually how you have that discipline with your mind. When you try and hold it, and that's that discipline, you're trying to do something, you're forcing it, external power, it's never still. You relax, let it go. Then it's still. That's how you get discipline, through letting it go. Because what's the way that we don't get discipline? Because discipline all these now, anger and desires and wanting and frustration and revenge, that causes the indiscipline of a human being. You've got to get to the cause of it. Once all those things are put down, then the discipline becomes natural. You know that in Buddhism, they say that you have all of these rules which you have to keep, but we have this thing called the simile of the raft that this raft, they say, is to get from one side, this shore, to the other shore. You know, from the place where there's uh, problems to enlightenment, the other shore. And, and the Buddha said in this great simile that once you get to the other shore, you can throw away the raft. Of course, you don't need it anymore. So when I first read that, I thought, oh, great, just keep these precepts until you're enlightened. And then you can have a good time afterwards. <laughs> You don't need to keep all these precepts and rules anymore. You're enlightened. It's, you, the raft is done. But the amazing thing is that you don't carry that raft. But when you're enlightened, the raft carries you. The raft doesn't disappear. The precepts, the rules, the five precepts, whatever it is, become natural. In other words, the discipline comes from within rather than being something forced from some ideas without you. You become the natural monk, the natural nun, the natural good person. So it becomes a discipline which is not coming from some sort of uh, idea or fear. That's one of the reasons why I rejected much of the Judeo-Christianity which I was taught as a young man. It was always fear. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell. If you misbehave, you'll be in big trouble. But I did misbehave. I wasn't in trouble. I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, something was wrong there. <laughs> but it's also, you find everybody was misbehaving. But because it wasn't coming from the right place. So actually to get that discipline, you first of all, you need that encouragement. You need that understanding. Now it's interesting with talking with top sports people, musicians and dancers. Because as a monk, it's a interesting lifestyle because you meet people from all stages of this life. You know, from the bricklayers or the, even the, the ex-cons or the cons you go and visit in jail to these very wealthy people to these 
millionaires to these highly successful sports people and and famous people in the world and movies no yeah movie stars and tv stars it's fascinating actually i went to sydney a couple of years ago and i was teaching meditation in this group and this lady she was kept on looking at me and smiling looking at me and smiling looking at me and smiling i don't know what she was up to <laughs> But, you know, you're a bit suspicious being a monk. <laughs> <laughs> and then after, the, after, after it was all finished, I asked one of the other people, who was that lady? And that she was some fam- really famous TV star, you know, who was on all of these movies and all of these um, uh, TV uh, docudramas and uh, TV series like Water Rats and other things. But because I didn't know TV, I didn't know who she was from anybody. So she was just doing that, you know, she was actually saying, recognize me? I said, no. <laughs> recognize me? No, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I think she was really fed up with me. <laughs> so it's great being about you don't know who, who these people are, and they get really upset when you don't recognize them. That's because they don't have a TV. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, sort of talking to some of these like top performers, because one of my old friends who was a monk together in the very, very early years, and he's one of actually the founders of our Buddhist society. But he, he's, uh, he went to live over in India because he married this Indian dancer, a classical Indian dancer. And when he came back, he showed me she was actually on the cover of these big glossy magazines in India. She was really famous. And she was coming over to Perth every now and again to perform. And I remember asking her this question, and it's a question which uh, I've asked many sort of top performers. But I knew the answer. And it's when you just want to hear what you already know. I said, how do you perform to such a high level? How do you discipline yourself so much to be sort of one of the top performers? Because you have to actually work so hard to reach that level. And she said what I've heard many, many times before. She said, I train, 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 train. I enjoy my training. But when it gets time to perform, I forget everything I was ever taught. I just really let go. Because if I remember all the steps, if I remember all the instructions, if I think about it, it all goes wrong. It doesn't flow. When I let go completely, I just abandon it. abandon myself. She said, it's like I'm sitting in this body, just watching all these feet and hands just move so gracefully. I don't do it at all. It just happens. That's how she performed to such a great level. And I've heard that, read that from so many other people. I think athletes say they get into the zone. I remember reading this article about these Olympic gymnasts, you know, people who won the gold medal, all saying that they have to really forget about themselves, forget about their training, forget about everything they've ever been taught. And they just go, and it's just a whole thing, just happens. But they don't get in the way. So they didn't go. That is the discipline. That's when things start to flow so smoothly. That's how you perform to the high level. So really, this is what I was saying earlier. Self-discipline is actually no self-discipline. Disciplining the no self. However, to get to those sorts of stages, we do need that training. And how can we actually get that initial training without actually messing up this beautiful way of natural discipline. And one of the beautiful features which I've found, which again, I learned from my meditation, which I also can learn uh, from my daily life as a monk, because sometimes when you do make mistakes, and you do need to sort of clean up your act, you know, do it better, how do you do that? The last thing is actually to punish yourself, to get down upon yourself, to be negative. Never do that because that makes matters worse. That's not the way to discipline yourself. Not with a stick. A metaphorical stick, I mean. Encouragement. But how does that encouragement work? Sometimes that encouragement, if it's persisting, can be just the same as the stick. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you do it. Oh, shut up. I'm trying my best. <laughs> So one needs that wise encouragement. 
what I call it is like conditioning the mind, brainwashing the mind. What you do is just give a few quiet, mindful suggestions to yourself. Not too many, just a few, but very clear. So for example, if you're getting up, you're finding it hard to get up in the morning, you just suggest to yourself before you go to sleep, I will get up early, I will get up early, I will get up early. Just encouraging yourself with mindful suggestions. And then you forget about it. And you find you get up early. The way of training the mind, the mind is very easy to train when you understand how it works. The reason why it's hard to train, two reasons, the suggestions or rather the instructions we give, number one, are unclear. Number two, we're not listening. <laughs> it's just like you've got a son or a daughter, a teenage daughter, and you can't get them to do what you want. Why is that? Because the instructions are unclear, not really clear what you want them to do. And number two, <laughs> they're not listening. <laughs> the same with you, you've got to listen. So, to give yourself instructions, you've got to be very mindful. Just stop and really listen and make it very, very clear. A simple instruction, like, I get up early in the morning. Or if you've got some problem, like you're a smoker, you give yourself that instruction. Next time I want to pick up a cigarette, I won't. Next time I want to pick up a cigarette, I won't. Next time I want to pick up a cigarette, I won't. Very clearly. But don't beat up on yourself and say, next time I pick up a cigarette, I won't. Do it gently. Otherwise, the mind will not listen. Clearly. The strange thing happens. You find your mind remembers. It's just basic hypnotism, basic brainwashing, basic conditioning, just the way the mind works. But the, our problem is, because we're not skillful, we discipline ourselves over much. Instead of doing it just the right amount, or not at all, we just do it too much. So the simile I usually give about the simile of the taxi driver. The simile of the taxi driver goes like this. Suppose from here you're going to the airport, and you've got a taxi to pick you up after the talk. And as you get into the taxi, you tell the taxi driver, I want to go to Perth Airport, got a plane to catch tonight. Now, I don't want you to travel too fast, nor too slow. Keep to the left side of the road. But I'm a Buddhist, so if anyone want to c wants to come in, please let them in. So, And don't sort of talk while, I'm, uh, while we're driving, because I want to be quiet, I want to meditate. And I've got to get there at that time, so please make sure you get there at that time. And don't smoke in the cab while I'm here. And please don't turn your radio on. And don't If you carry on like that, the taxi driver will throw you out before you get to the end of Nansen Way. Now that's actually what we do to ourselves. We're always giving ourselves orders. Come on, do this. Come on, get there. Come on, do this. Come on, don't do that. Come on, come on, come on. No wonder your mind rebels. They, th <laughs> they throw you out. I'm not listening to you anymore. Shut up. So to actually to get discipline in the mind, to train the mind, you have to be very gentle. Just a few suggestions. And then stop. And you'll be amazed just how that mind reacts. I tell this at every meditation retreat, but it's a good little experiment for you to do tonight. When I was first told this, I didn't believe it, but I put it into practice, and my goodness, it worked. What time you have to get up tomorrow morning? Set your alarm clock, most of you have alarm clocks, to five minutes past that time, just in case. Say it's sort of eight o'clock. Set your alarm clock to five past eight. But tell yourself, just before you go to sleep, very clearly, three times, I will wake up at eight o'clock. I will wake up at eight o'clock. I will wake up at eight o'clock. Set your alarm clock to five past eight so you don't worry. And I guarantee most of you will wake up five minutes before your alarm goes off. One or two minutes either side. 
It's just showing you just the power of the mind, the power of positive suggestion. If you can do that for waking up, that's a disciplining of your mind. You can start doing that with other things as well. For example, you may have bad speech habits to your partner. <laughs> In other words, you get angry at them and you shout at them. You don't sort of talk the right things to them. You don't encourage them. You don't talk sweetly to them. If you've got bad speech habits like that, how do you discipline yourself to stop that, which is going to uh, ruin your relationship? Trying to punish yourself doesn't work. Trying to say, I must, I did it again, I'm not going to do this again. Banging yourself, this is what I'm doing now, banging myself, trying to hurt myself. That's not how you do it. You say, nice me, I'm going to be trying to be better. <laughs> 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 Encourage yourself with kindness. Because you listen there with a bit of kindness. And number two, don't overdo it. Just say a couple of times, nice me. I'm going to be kind to my, my wife. I'm going to speak nice things to my husband. I'm going to be, next time I get angry, I'm not going to say anything nasty. And by encouraging yourself positively, with kindness, with mindfulness, it's amazing how much it works, how easy it works. Because you find yourself about to say something you shouldn't, and something comes into the mind and stops you. It's mindfulness, program mindfulness. Mindfulness in Buddhism is the great controller in the sense that it can actually change the way you live your life. Mindfulness is like instead of following the same old way, walking through the same door, you can go through other doors. How many of you who come here every Friday night sit in the same place? I do. <laughs> but I've got no choice. I have to. <laughs> now, you see, that's lack of mindfulness, lack of awareness. Awareness means you can sit in other places. You can do things in other ways. You've got other opportunities you're much more resourceful. So actually to discipline oneself, one needs those more resources. Not doing it in the same old negative way, you can go through another door, a positive way. But actually to get that mindfulness established, you can program, you can condition yourself to say, next time I sort of get my buttons pushed by my husband, by my wife, by my kids, by my parents, by my boss at work, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to react. You can program yourself like that. And my goodness, it's so powerful how well it works. And see, that's a very powerful and easy way to get discipline, which is actually just to train your mind, to train your speech, to train your body. Even if you have a hard time, there's any young people here studying. Oh, I don't feel like studying. You can program yourself to say, look, I have to study. I'm going to put some joy into it. The next time I open that book, it's time to do my homework or time to do my study. I'm going to enjoy it. Next time I open that book, I'm going to enjoy it. Next time I'm going to open that book, I'm going to enjoy it. What that really means, you're brainwashing yourself to enjoy it. You can brainwash yourself to enjoy anything. Next time I come to Nonamara Centre, I'm going to enjoy it. Next time I come to... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you have to do in your life but there's all these things I'm a senior monk I have to go and do this I have to go and do that I have to go to a funeral I have to go and see someone who's sick sometimes people ring up and they've got problems with their third eye <laughs> they say go and see an optometrist <laughs> well they've got this optometrist four eyes that's close enough for the third eye <laughs> So sometimes, there was a time when I thought, why do I have to do this? I didn't become a monk to answer all these silly questions. <laughs> I became a monk to sit in a cave and enjoy myself. <laughs> but you discipline yourself. You say, I've got to do this, I might as well enjoy it. You've got to study, you might as well enjoy it. And I've done that for the last, I don't know how many years, whatever I have to do, I might as well enjoy it. Like going to the dentist. My dentist is here this evening somewhere, I don't know where he is. He's our secretary. Last time I went to the dentist, 
that is such a good time. I don't know if it was the cocaine you put in my mouth or something. It may, <laughs> may have got in my head. <laughs> it was just so comfortable in that chair, I didn't want to get up. <laughs> we don't have like chairs like that in our monastery, just sit on the hard concrete. <laughs> Maybe a cushion or two, but those chairs in the dentist are really nice. <laughs> so you've got to do it, you might as well enjoy yourself. So you can see how you can put joy into whatever you're doing. Or you could actually go to the dentist, oh, go to the dentist, I don't want to go to that dentist anymore. Oh, I don't want to do this. Now you see how that you create the indiscipline of that soldiers, I don't want to follow the order, I don't want to do what I need to do, I don't want to do what I have to do. And that's where we get the indiscipline from. We become rebellious against what is obvious we need to do. Maybe we force ourselves to do it, but there's no fun in it. Negative reinforcement. We get depressed, angry, we get grumpy. And that's no way to have discipline. The best and only way to have that discipline, put happiness into it, program that happiness into it, until you want to do it. You see the benefit in it. And you program that benefit into it. And that way you can just do anything. You become a disciplined person. Whatever it is you have to do in your life, whatever you want to do, you can actually change your whole life. Program yourself, create that mindfulness, and that get that wisdom coming up, that compassion, that kindness. Kindness is a way for discipline. You know that sometimes that some of these teachers, like my teacher Ajahn Chah, was just so kind. He just wanted to do what he told you to. It was just strange that sometimes we talk about it. How do we allow that man to do these things for us, to us? We'd have to have to sit up all night. Sometimes, you know, he'd send us to these monasteries without a moment's notice. Sometimes you'd be happy in this monastery, having a good time. He'd turn up and said, you're going to the other side of Thailand. Oh, tomorrow, next week? No, now. <laughs> I was just settling in there, go. <laughs> and yet, sometimes you would think that he can't do this to me. But we never actually think like that. We just allowed it to happen. Because it's all done through this amazing compassion and kindness. Just uh, in this little book which is coming out soon, there's one passage and the people actually, who the editors say, can we put that passage in? That makes Ajahn Chah look like a sadist. <laughs> and I said, no, this is what happened. And he was actually out of compassion. That was when one of our monks, he was actually disciplining him, actually how to give talks. They were training him. That's what discipline is. So he had to give a talk in Thai on one of the... the, the uh, the Poya days, one of the, the moon days. So he had to go up onto the, the, uh, the seat and give a talk for one hour in Thai. He finished the talk, he was about to get down, and Ajahn Chah said, another hour. <laughs> and when Ajahn Chah says something like that, you just do it. So again, this, you know, for Westerner, there's only so much Thai you know. <laughs> and after an hour, you've exhausted most of it. <laughs> And so he started repeating himself many times, the same old stories. And if he managed to get through the second hour. He was about to get down and Ajahn Chah <laughs> said, another hour. <laughs> and by this time, that you know, you don't know what to say. There was long pauses between sentences while he was trying to think what to say. And people had lost their faith by this time and were walking out. Those people who were still in were half asleep or were just chatting to each other, not paying any attention. And even the, the lizards on the wall were all asleep. <laughs> but he managed to get through, managed three hours of a talk in time. No one was listening at all. Got down, Ajahn Chah said, another hour. <laughs> he had to do four hours. But he said afterwards, he plumbed the depths of audience response. <laughs> so after that, he didn't care if people sort of enjoyed his talk or didn't enjoy his talk. <laughs> when you've done something like that, four hours of a boring talk, that's how you're trained. That's how you're disciplined. It doesn't matter if people like your talk or you don't like your talk, you just give, not expecting anything back in return. You see the beautiful discipline. And why are we allowed Ajahn Chah to do that? Because it was done out of compassion and kindness. When anybody did anything wrong, he just laughed his head off. He thought it was so funny. <laughs> For example, when I was learning Thai, because if any requisite which I needed, 
you know, anything to live by, you used to have to go and ask your teacher. He had this big, big drum of you know, toothpaste and soap, and I asked for some soap once because I ran out of soap. Only the, the Thai word for soap is very close to the Thai word for pineapple. <laughs> so when I went up to his hut, I, I actually asked for a pineapple. I, mean, I thought I was asking for soap. And he looked at me just very straight, what do you want pineapple for? So I had to use like sign language and say, no, to, to wash my body. <laughs> of course, that should, I creased up with laughter. <laughs> And he always told the other people that I was the, the Western monk who washed with pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was so funny, but at least I, I knew from that time on the difference, the Thai word between pineapple and soap. <laughs> I really learned. <laughs> but because it was all done with kindness, with compassion, with laughter, it was a tremendous discipline. You wanted actually to learn. You wanted to do these things because there was kindness behind it. People had your goodwill at heart. And that's actually why you learned. That's why you trained. That's why you grew. I saw that was the way that my teacher, Ajahn Chah, taught us. And I realized that that was a teaching on how I could train myself in exactly the same way. So you make a mistake, you make a silly mistake, <laughs> you, you laugh. You know that beautiful saying, which I, I first learned this as a school teacher. If you make a mistake and all the class in front of you is laughing, you laugh as well. Then they're never laughing at you. They're only laughing with you. Isn't that a beautiful way of life? So if you make a fool of yourself, you laugh. And then the world only laughs with you. Never laughs at you. <laughs> so we train ourselves uh, with that joy. And with that joy, with that energy, the discipline comes very quickly. It comes very naturally. Whatever we want to do in life, whatever is our job, whatever is we're trying to succeed in in life, and you find it becomes very easy to do. Whether it's meditation, no bell silence, don't push yourself. Encourage yourself. Don't be hard upon yourself. Forgive yourself, be gentle, be compassionate, and you grow much faster. You succeed more easily. And you enjoy every minute of it. That way, when you want to get up in the morning, it's easy to get up in the morning. You want to. When you're, when you're studying, you want to. You psych yourself up. You put energy. You put joy into it, whatever you're doing. And you know that that's what I've done as a monk. Whatever you have to do in your life. Even going to see autopsies. You get, have fun in it. You have joy in it. One of the autopsies I saw over here years ago is this Scottish um, uh, pathologist. I think he became... Uh, quite fa well, he kind of not notorious. I think he got into trouble in Sydney because he moved to Sydney afterwards. I forget what his name was. But when he was cutting up this lady, there was all this <laughs> um, inside her stomach was um, that's right. Uh, what was it mixed vegetables? You know, this dice mixed vegetables. And he said it's the same on a Glasgow bus on a Saturday night <laughs> <laughs> because all these Glaswegians they always get drunk and they sort of vomit on the bus. He said exactly what's the same. That's what you see on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very funny man as <laughs> he was doing this autopsy. <laughs> so you might as well put joy into it. <laughs> Whatever you're doing in life. <laughs> and that's the best way to have discipline. You want to do it. It's fun to do it. It becomes easy to do it. Not done out of fear. That's how we discipline our mind. If you know how to discipline your mind, see what all those things you want to abandon, those harmful, hurtful, stupid, the sort of little things we do. All those beautiful things we do, encouraging them, making fun out of this, and you find that, that is the best way to train. That's where my self-discipline comes from. That's why I get up early in the morning, meditate late at night, where I can work hard, I can keep my rules very easily. I can be a very strict monk without being a heavy monk. That's how self-discipline works. No self-discipline. Disciplining the mind. So there we go. That's an hour's talk. Any questions about the talk this evening? <laughs> Any questions, comments, complaints? 
<laughs> okay. Okay, we get our announcements now from our well-disciplined uh, president. <laughs> Off you go.